So I've started writing my skeleton for State of Indy. That means, essentially, I'm kind of wrapping up my secondary research on the state of the market, all of that kind of thing. I haven't gotten all of my quotes yet, but I have enough information I can start to write. The little in-between pieces, kind of filling out the entire narrative of what 2024 looks like in terms of the indie games market. And I did a video, or like a little podcast, at the beginning of this year, where I mentioned that when you talk about it being a good year for indie games, small developers, whatever you want to call them, uh, you're really talking about two things. One, was it a good year overall for all of the games? And two, was it a good year for any individual developer? Well, uh, I started to kind of collect information on that. And uh, all my data for this, by the way, is going to come from a site called Gamalytic. Uh, I usually use VG Insights, but VG Insights and Gamalytic have different data on them. So I may use one or the other or both, depending on what I need to do. But looking at Gamalytic, so far as of this recording, which is halfway into July, uh, the revenue from what at least is tagged as indie games on Steam is $1.1 billion. Now, that's not actually a very good metric because, first, there are a lot of games that are tagged as indie that probably you and I would not consider to be independently developed games. And second, it ignores the console markets, although, by all measures, the console market isn't that significant. So, for my purposes, it's good enough. Just to remember that there are some little issues here, and you shouldn't go too much by what any of these numbers say. But based on that, it's $1.1 billion. Now, on the surface, that's pretty damn good. Last year, my estimates for what the market was doing was between $1.5 and $2 billion, which it does appear I was a little high on that. Um, Gamalytic claims last year was about one3 so we're only a little bit past the halfway mark. We're already at 1.1. So sounds like it should be a really good year. If things kept up this at this rate, nice and steady, this would be, by that metric, at least the best year ever for indie games. Uh, I do not believe it's going to be like that. $1.1 billion. One third of that, a third of that is Pal World. Pal World by itself is one third of all of the indie game revenue this year. Add in Sons of the Forest, which is number two, and you're past the halfway mark. Half of all of that money came from two games. Two games. Uh, if you go up to the top 10, it's about 75%. But let's just single that out. Two games between them generated half of all the revenue. And this is part of the consolidation. If you follow the kind of business side of video games at all, this is something they've been talking about a lot that you're seeing more and more money go to a smaller and smaller number of games. Generally, a smash hit, something like Hades 2, which is the um, number four game on this list, that one turned over, their estimates are $34.3 million, and that's typical for like a really big indie hit. Uh, but Pal World, Sons of the Forest, I'll even throw in Less Epoch at number three, made way more than that. And it's games like that are the reason. If it ends up being a really big year, it's games like that. The assumption we are making that this would be the biggest year assumes steady growth, which I don't think you can assume. What other games are coming out that are going to do numbers like that? What are the really big ones on the horizon? Uh, Black Myth. Let's throw in Black Myth. Black Myth will do very well. It will do extremely well, but is it going to do... $180 million? Probably not. Is it going to do $90 million like Last Epoch? Probably not. Could do Hades 2 money, could do Outlast Trials money, but it's not going to do uplift this entire sector of the industry by itself money. I do think overall this is going to be, on paper at least, a very strong year, but if it is a very strong year, it's going to be because a small number of games were genuine phenomena. On a whole, this is probably going to be a pretty weak year for video games, and that's been projected. The PC market is actually projected to shrink a little bit, 
So why is that? Because our assumption, my assumption at least, has been, all right, a weak year for AAA, for A tier more generally, great year for indies. That's usually how it works out. And it is how it's going to work out. But what we're seeing here is kind of the limit of what these smaller developers can do. And the question is why? Why isn't the indie market growing faster than it actually is? And I think it comes down to two things. And the first one is, who are the people who are actually buying and playing these games? There's been this whole absolutely ridiculous casual versus hardcore nonsense that's been going on in this community for a long time. And far be it for me to get involved with that. It's something I never wanted to do. But during my research last year, I think I actually pinned it down. And it's something that's directly relevant to me. The line between the casual gamer and the hardcore gamer is indies. It's whether or not you play indies. Your actual casual, whatever, like, the sneering you want to do at people who, like, match threes or whatever, the actual line is between people who exclusively play AAA games and people who tri play AAAs plus indies. And if you think about it, it makes sense. You don't need to do a lot of research. You don't need to be really tuned into the culture to know when a major release A-tier game is coming out. Everybody knows. People who don't play video games know. Everybody knows these days. But indie games, you have to be a lot more clued in. You have to do research, something I know about. What I have to do to find all the information for this, it does. It takes actual work. And to do that work, you need to care about it. People who exclusively play AAA games tend to be less invested in what we're doing here. These are, statistically speaking, people who do not identify as gamers, quote-unquote. These are people who play major release games because they think they're fun. And in a year where there are no major release games, they don't go and look at the indies to find something to pick up the slack. They just find something else to do entirely. We have endless options for entertainment these days. If the video games are boring, you just do something else. It doesn't help that we are in the last year before new hardware comes out, new consoles. Now, if you look at the kind of the cycle, video game sales, there is a bit of a wax and wane to them, at least in terms of the rate of growth, if not the overall sales. And what you get is the lowest point is always the year before the first new consoles in a generation come out. The highest year tends to be not so much the first year after the consoles come out, because not that many people have them yet. It's a year or two after that. But then once you get to the end of the console, there's a uh, end of a console cycle, rather, there's a bit of a lull, and we're in that right now. Setting aside that there haven't been a, a lot of major AAA releases this year, it was going to be a slow year anyway just because everyone is waiting for the new hardware. Your dedicated console gamers, already a little bit less connected to the indie scene because less of it's on the consoles, so the result is a lot of these people have just kind of decided to take a break. They've just stepped back and decided, okay, there's no games coming out this year, I'll do something else, you know, I'll, there's who the hell knows how many obscure streaming services I haven't completely exhausted their catalogs yet. Let's just go watch seven or eight of those. And that's what they're doing. They're doing things other than video games. The second factor is something we've known about for a while, for the better part of a decade, and yet I feel like a lot of commentators have really not come to grips with this, which is that there has been a sea change in how people buy and play games, and I'm not talking about like digital distribution, that's not what I mean. What I mean is that people are buying and playing fewer games. We talked a little bit earlier about consolidation. Uh, you can see that if you look at the number of hours put into these games, the number is down because people are putting all of their time into fewer and fewer games. These days, people are not necessarily waiting for the next big release like they did when I was a child. What you have is people picking one game, maybe two, at the outside three, and sticking with them for years on end. 
And of course, I'm talking about live service, I'm talking about competition games, but also talking about other types of games that people just replay over and over and over again uh, for thousands of hours. A lot of these are RPGs. The art typical example would be Skyrim. Uh, BG3 would be a more recent example of a game like this. Strategy games also fall into this. You might notice that when I do these, I've started using uh, Europa Universalis 4 as my B-roll. Well, that's because I play it all the time. Uh, I, this year, will probably end up reviewing at least 100 games, uh, depending on how many people get back to me, how many I decide to buy on my own. But for all of that, EU4 will definitely have the most hours and will maybe have the most total hours. In other words, add up all the other games, they may still be less than this one. So it's trivially easy for me to just, while I'm playing this anyway, just turn on OBS and use it to get some B-roll to put into, into a, a video like this. More and more people are thinking the way I think in terms of this. More and more people are picking out a, a smaller number of games, often just a single one, and just sticking with it. And they're not going out and buying a lot of new games. And that sucks. It sucks for the indie market because the whole thing that makes this work is people trying new things. It's that old game of getting like a $100 Steam card and going out and seeing how many games you can buy in it and getting all these weird little titles you'd never heard from, but some of them end up being really cool and you tell your friends. That is the kind of market that advantages the people whose games I feature. And we're not in it. We are in a completely different environment right now where people are just not experimenting as much. So the less dedicated people are just stepping back from games overall in 2024, and the more dedicated people are ignoring the market and just digging deeper into what they were already playing. And the result is there just isn't a lot of exploration for these smaller games. Yes, it is going to end up being a big year overall, but so much of that is because Pal World has made over a third of a billion dollars by itself. That's extraordinary. Hades 2, which got a lot of attention just from the mainstream video game press, yeah, it did really well, but it didn't do anywhere close. It did a tenth. It did a tenth of what Pal World did. And if it was not for that game, this would not be such a strong year uh, in the end, it was all down to just a handful of games from the beginning of the year that absolutely blew up. So strong year for indies overall, questionable. Strong year for individual developers, definitely not. And by the way, that is what I am hearing from a lot of the people I talk to. You know, keeping in mind, I talk to people who are doing reasonably well. They're not necessarily making huge hits but they are doing games that are making money that would be considered successful by most metrics. And I keep hearing over and over from people who are telling me that contrary to what I went into this assuming, 2024 is not a strong year. That things, I've, I've had people tell me that they think things are going to go up, that this is actually the low point and it's going to go up from here. Anyway, that's my analysis as it stands right now. Let me know what you think about this in the comments below.